I'm Jeff Schulman. I'm a professor at the Foster School of Business. I'm in the marketing department where I teach product management, and I'm excited to announce that we have just launched the Product Management Center. So the Foster School of Business is now home to a hub for knowledge, for community, and for impact. And it's a hub that's not open just to our students and to our alumni, but to the entire world. We really want to, we see a lot of value in bringing product managers together, sharing knowledge, uh, sharing ideas, and uh, really giving us everybody a place to learn, to connect and develop. And when we do that, uh, it's going to be better for our world-class faculty. It's going to be better for our world-class students. And I think it's going to be better for the companies here in our backyard where we have some of the most innovative companies in the world. And so this all started with the Foster the Product series, which is the first Thursday of every month. And uh, we have a bonus here with Jackie Bovaro, uh, which I'm super excited because many of you have read her work and are probably eagerly awaiting getting your hands on her latest book, Cracking the PM Career. And so Foster the Product events are open to the public. Uh, so feel free to invite a friend. And they're more than just a chance to hear world-class ideas. They're a chance uh, to form a community. We're going to hear from Jackie. Uh, we're then going to have some Q&A. So now I want to transition to introducing our speaker. This is somebody who has probably shaped, um, I, gosh, I was going to say thousands, but I have no idea that it's, it's got to be more. There's countless people's lives have been affected by our speaker as she wrote one of the most popular books about getting into a, a PM, a product management job with the Cracking the PM interview. And now here she is to talk about her newest book, which is gonna change even more lives because it's not just about getting that job, but excelling in that job uh, and not just a job, but a career. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, uh, the author, uh, co-author of Cracking the PM Career, Jackie Bavaro. Yay. <laughs> oh, look at all those claps. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm going to do about 20 minutes on my slides, which means I'm going to just zoom right through them. And so anything you have questions on, you know, we go, we've got plenty of time for Q&A to, to kind of dig in with more details. Um, and you see my Twitter name there in case any of you want to follow along and stuff like that. So yeah, a little bit of my background. Um, I started as product management right out of school. Um, became an intern at Microsoft. I've spent time at Google, at Asana, and I uh, at Asana, I started as the first PM, grew to be head of product management. Um, and while I was there, wrote the first book. And then over the past year, have been writing this uh, new book. So I wanted to start off by talking about what is a product manager? So I know there's some aspiring pan product managers on this call. And you can see sort of my little word cloud of lots of ways people like to describe the job. But I really like to describe it as a member of the core product triad. So this is the person who works with the engineering lead and the designer. So your engineering lead solves the problem technically, your designer solves the problem from a user experience perspective, and the product manager is the person who's picking which problem should we solve. Um, and so a lot of times people ask me like, what's a typical day like in the life of a product manager? And that really depends on what part of the product life cycle you're in. So when you're in the discovery phase, this is when you're trying to decide what problems are out there in the world. And you'll spend a lot of time talking to customers, maybe going on customer site visits, um, doing lots of user research, looking at competitors, um, lots of like exploratory data analysis. When you get to the define stage, this is where you might be drawing out a vision, thinking about what goals and metrics you want to go after, doing data analysis to narrow in on which of the different ideas might be most promising. Uh, during design, you'll work hand in hand with your designer, you might do usability studies, you might be writing a spec. During development, you'll work on um, lots of communication to people, solving problems as they come up, talking to stakeholders. And then delivery, you work um, hand in hand with your marketing partners to figure out what are all the things we need to do to make sure that this launch goes really, really well. Um, and finally, at the debrief stage, you'll analyze how everything went, see what you can learn and start planning for the next phase. Um, so a lot of people want to know um, if product management might be a good role for them. And um, so I've sort of drawn out some of the, the pros and cons. Um, some of the ones on here, I won't read through all of them, but some of the ones I think are most interesting is that really the tra core trade-off you get in product management is you get broader impact because you're, you're getting your impact through influencing others rather than creating things yourself. And so that creates a lot of trade-offs. Um, if you're the kind of person who's really motivated by this broad impact, um, then you might love product management. 
Um, but it, but you might, if you're the kind of person who will miss that hands-on creation of things um, and that like satisfaction of, I built it, I, um, I hit compile and it compiled and now I know I did it right. Um, then you might not, then uh, it might be a tougher switch to product management. So in product management, there's a lot of ambiguity. Most of the problems we solve are tough. There's no right answer. You get less uh, reward and like acknowledgement that you've done things right. Um, there's also a lot of explaining your reasoning. So some people say, I wanna become a PM because I, want, I don't want people to keep asking me questions. I wanna make all the decisions. And that's not what their role is like. Um, you have to first persuade your entire team of what you think the right thing to do is. And then you need to persuade us, your cross-functional partners, your executives. People are constantly asking questions and asking you to defend the decisions you've made. Um, some people love that. Um, and some people that's, that's a nightmare. <laughs> Um, and finally, um, with product management, so, some disciplines, you can really get the time to get things perfect, where like really you can just, you know, take eight hours and work your way through the design and get every part of it just right. But great PMs have to do a lot of context switching, a lot of prioritizing which things are most important. And a lot of the time, the work that we need to hand over is just good enough rather than perfect. So you've written a spec and you'd love to spend, you know, another two days getting it just right but uh, that'll slow your whole team down by two days. So you give them the spec a little bit early. You send out quick drafts of things instead of getting them just all the way perfect. And for some people that's, you know, that's kind of enlivening. And for some people that uh, that's very scary. Um, so uh, with that about what the product management role is like, I wanted to go into uh, things I've learned about successful PMing. So the first one is that great PMs always start with the goals. So what this means is as the PM role, it's your job to define the problem, to think about what are the constraints that we're operating under? What are the frameworks we should use to make these uh, product decisions? Like what product principles should we have? And what does success look like? How will we know if we've, if we've achieved our goals? Um, now, one of the interesting things about being a PM is most times people don't hand you problems. They hand you solutions. Uh, customers come to you with feature requests. Executives stop you in the hallway and tell you what they think you ought to build. And it's our job as product managers to reverse engineer the problem, to take the solution people told us and dig deeper to understand what problem were they trying to solve and then to think broadly about better, about potentially better solutions. And focusing on the goals and the problem is not just good for creating good products, it's also how as product managers we scale. Um, if you want to be able to free up time so that you can work on more strategic work, you need to find ways to empower the people on your team to work even when you're not in the room. And you do that by really focusing on honing um, your definition of what the problem is. Uh, the next thing is that great PMs validate their ideas. So uh, this one I love because it's the opposite of what you do for PM interviews. In PM interviews, you have to come up with great ideas. But in the real job, it's not the people who come up with the best ideas who are the best PMs. It's the ones who are the best at validating ideas that come from anywhere. Um, it's really important to find cheap and fast ways to narrow in on the ideas that might work and discard the ones that don't. And it doesn't have to take a long time to do this. You can draw sketches and show them to people. You can do some quick data analysis to see how many people are even visiting the part of the product you want to improve. Um, but whichever way it is, make sure you do some sort of validation before you make long, large investments. And even once you've started a large investment, validate along the way so that if you're going the wrong direction, you'll catch it as soon as possible. Um, next thing about great PMs is that they love products and study great products. So um, one of uh, a lot of what looks like creativity is just taking an idea from one place and combining it with another. So for example, YouTube has had user-generated videos for a long time, and Reddit has had an algorithmic homepage that you don't need to log in to see for a long time. And TikTok took these two ideas, combined them together, and all of a sudden, because of the nature of video, it feels like a brand new idea. Um, and I see this pattern again and again. When I look at really innovative products and I, I ask people where they got the idea, a lot of times they, they found it by studying some other product and bringing that idea into a new domain where it feels brand new. Um, next, I wanted to talk about stakeholder management. Um, uh, uh, product managers uh, work with people all across the company, and working with stakeholders is a big part of our job. 
Um, so conflicts sometimes arise. And the first thing to know there is that it's really important to invest time in understanding your stakeholders. So you want to understand what is their job? Why is their job important to the company? What are their goals? What are they afraid of? How does this person get promoted? Um, and the better you can understand your stakeholders, the better you'll be able to earn their trust and come up with solutions that will work for both of you. Um, and when you do come up with a disagreement, it's important to figure out, is it a disagreement about information where you can just share your information or assumptions where maybe you can do a quick uh, validation or research to figure out which assumption is right or values? Because when you disagree on values, a lot of times this is a strategic disagreement. And once you've discussed for a little while and clarified that like, I'm, I'm choosing my, I have this stance because I think uh, revenue is most important. You have this stance because you think user growth is most important. Um, sometimes it doesn't make sense to discuss with the other person as much anymore. This is a time you need to loop in someone who's more responsible for that broader strategy so they can make the strategic decision, which then can help you resolve the, the conflicts you're having with your stakeholders. Um, now we talked a bunch about skills and I really want to talk about uh, PM careers now. So one of the big surprises for me uh, when I was thinking about PM careers and when I was researching this book um, is that, and through my own careers, I had, I had always, I'd started off thinking that PM career is like a straight line up. You get better and better and better at shipping products and you get promotions for that and eventually you end up a CEO. And that is not how it works. So what I found is that there's three distinct phases of a PM's career. Early on, you're responsible for shipping great products that delight users and hit the goals. But at some point, getting better at that isn't how you get promoted. When you're trying to break into senior product management roles, um, you become responsible. You need to add on the second phase, which is product strategy. So not just achieving the goals you were given, but setting the new goals, defining an inspiring vision and figuring out how your team will get there, um, creating a strategy that will win in the marketplace. And so you can get better and better and better at that. And once you move into people management, what you'll find is that there's another part of your job that gets added on that becomes important to continue to advance, and that's organizational excellence. So once you're a product leader, your job isn't just creating winning strategies and shipping winning products, but it's building a strong team um, and coaching them and developing them so that they can create those products and that strategy. And at that level, about half your job is managing down to your team, but about half of your job is helping the rest of the organization uh, with the strategy that they need and creating the context that the rest of the company needs so that the great product work your team is doing will lead to, uh, to real success. So I wanted to dive into product strategy. Um, a lot of people will get told at some point in their career that they need to be more strategic and people will then wonder, well, what does that mean? And what I found is that product strategy has three parts. The first part is the vision. So this is your inspiring picture of what the future could be like. Um, I like to think about them as an infomercial. You know, for Asana, we would say, you know, it's, it's people do so much time and work about work. It's so hard to waste all of your energy in these status update meetings, um, but there's a better way. Um, imagine if as you checked off tasks on your own to-do list, it updated the central system, the dashboards were automatically uh, updated and your manager gets notified if anybody's overworked so they can easily redistribute work. So that, that inspiring vision serves a lot of goals. It motivates the people on your team. It helps you recruit people to your team. And you can show it to, um, to your potential customers to see if they're also inspired by it, to validate if that's, an, if that's a worthwhile direction to go, um, if you found something that resonates. Um, then you get your strategic framework. And this is where you start to sort of lay out the target market that you're going after, your core product pillars. What are the, what are the key components that you believe are important to get right in order to win this marketplace? Um, and that can be several like themes that you think of. And then you get your roadmap. So this is usually grouped by theme, but roughly over the next, you know, maybe two to three years, what are the large chunks of work you're going to do that will help you get from here to achieving your vision? And it's not a commitment, um, but it's really important step for a few reasons. One of them is that a lot of times when you lay this out, you'll see that the current path you're going on is too small and incremental to get you to your vision in, um, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, sometimes just writing this out on, on paper or a whiteboard you, you opens your eyes to see how much larger the steps you need to take are if you want to achieve this ambitious vision. 
Um, this is also lets you plan ahead and uh, plan with other functions. So you look at your roadmap, you might realize you need to hire more people to achieve your vision fast enough, or you have to hire people with a certain specialty, like a hardware engineer or a data scientist to be able to achieve it. And so this roadmap, along with the rest of your strategy, is what helps you advocate for the uh, getting a larger team. Again, the size of team you need. Um, and then I'm going to just kind of quickly go through some of these last slides that, that apply more once you're already in the product management role. Um, the first is that a good roadmap is like a charcuterie board. You don't want your charcuterie board to be all meat or all cheese or all fruit, but you want to align on and think up front about ideally, how do I want, what's the percentage I want of each of these uh, foods or each of these goals? And once you choose the percentage up top, then you can fill in each with its own goal rather than trying to create a stacked list where you have to try to prioritize engineering each engineering debt feature against each new product feature. Um, and finally, partnering with your manager on your career goals. Um, your manager is hugely influential in your career. And so it's worth it to, um, to think about your own goals, talk about your goals with your manager, learn what goals they have, find ways for that partnership to work. Um, in terms of goals, the best way to share them is forward looking to say, I'd love to be a senior PM one day. Uh, what would you suggest that I focus on now so I'll be ready when the opportunity is there? Um, and for proactively sharing your work, I love this template of um, here's what I'm working on, you know, here's the challenge that I faced, here's how I'm planning on handling it. How does that sound? That gives you a chance to take ownership of the work you're doing, um, brag about it a little, do self-advocacy to your manager, and um, invite feedback. Um, and with that, that's uh, the slides I had. So uh, from that, I'm going to stop sharing and we will move into Q&A. All right, thank you so much. So let me tell you how Q&A goes, but for, uh, first let's all give a round of applause. Thank you so much, Jackie, for spending time preparing a, a valuable presentation for everybody here. Uh, so now, thank you, Jackie, let's get to questions here. Uh, and I have one and everybody can now jump in into chat as you've had a chance to check those links out. Um, if there are multiple stakeholders, this one's from Neha, if there are multiple stakeholders, how can you satisfy everyone's expectations when all of them want something different from the product? Nice. Thank you for that uh, question. So um, when you have multiple stakeholders, the importance of a strategy becomes even more important. So this is a place where um, as you're working on your strategy, what you'll want to do. So I, when I write my strategy, I try to think about what questions am I going to get? What requests am I going to get? And how can I write some, some higher level principles into the strategy document uh, that will help us answer those later on? Um, so for example, one way to handle um, multiple stakeholders is if they really have separate goals, you can use that uh, charcuterie board metaphor to say, okay, you know, I think it would be a mistake on our team. You know, we have a sales team. The sales team needs to keep making forward progress on the sales they're doing today. Um, I think it would be a mistake to spend less than, you know, 15% of our roadmap um, on things that the sales team needs for our current customers. Does that sound good to everyone? But then I want to spend at least, you know, 50% of our roadmap working towards these new customer base that we really want to go after. So really at the strategy level, before you get to the, the details of the actual features people want, try to get alignment on, on those goals, which goals are more important than each other. Um, how are you going to prioritize them? How much energy to go to each of them? And sometimes you'll have a, um, a disagreement, like a strategic disagreement, like of how much risk are we willing to take to move forward on this? Or is it more important to, um, to support developers or end users? Or any of these, these sort of strategic disagreements. Um, and you can look at the uh, specific product disagreements you have to try to like um, discover what the what the underlying strategic disagreement was and then resolve that in the strategy document and then once your teams are moving forward uh, you won't have uh, then you can just always refer back to that strategy that your stakeholders all agreed to to um, to move forward and if you have two stakeholders if it's hard to come to that agreement um, I like to take the two stakeholders have them in a room with each other so they can talk to each other and all sort of moderate so they understand each other's feedback um, but if they really are at odds, then uh, I would make sure in that strategy meeting that I have a manager who is somehow responsible for both of them. And that person might speak in the meeting or might not speak in the meeting, but at least their presence will encourage everyone to come to a, uh, an agreement. A question from Wei Ming. Can you share a product strategy framework that is most often used in industry? Yeah, I, 
I, what I would say is that there is no standard framework that is going to get you your product strategy. Your product strategy um, is not just like you plug in Porter's five forces or something like that. It really is a customized um, framework that matches what you specifically need for your for your team or for your product. So, for example, for Asana, um, early on. Uh, part of our strategy was this concept that Asana should be your team brain. And then we said, well, what does a team brain need? It needs to know all of the information about your work. It needs to draw insightful connections between the different parts of work. And it needs to always be with you. And then we took each of those and we, we expanded them with lots of description of what they meant and what success might look like for each of those. But those three sort of product pillars, and I think we had more at the time, um, but those product pillars were, were our strategic framework, very, very customized. Uh, so now from an early career, P, for an er, early career PM, how would you balance between gaining in-depth knowledge in a topic versus gaining breadth in a wide range of knowledge areas? Yeah, so I would say that generalist PMs are incredibly popular. You don't need to specialize as a PM. Um, if you do want to specialize, though, um, that can make you more valuable to your company in that specific area. So uh, I would recommend more often going broad, but it can, it can really vary depending on um, the type of company you're at and the, the type of expertise that is needed. And in either case, even when you're going broad on knowledge, you need to become the expert on your product. You need to become the expert on your customers, your use cases and the system to understand how, like, if I make a change to the product over here, what are the other systems that might be affected by those? And this question is from Anshul. I hope I got that correct. Uh, what does a good APM slash manager relationship look like uh, during your first couple of years in the industry? So what's the best way to communicate the value you add versus the growth that you want to achieve? Yeah. So um, at the APM level, the, uh, the next promotion you're going to get, and sometimes it'll go like APM1 to APM2 to PM1, this really is about, um, this is the stage where you're getting better and better at shipping product. So, um, so this is really the stage where it's important to learn, to start off, learn how your company ships product. What's the product process? How do you write a spec? What needs to get reviewed? How do you do customer research? Um, how do you manage your team and keep things going? And really, um, like the core things of success that I would look at here is can you ship products well, and then can you ship them autonomously? So early on, like ask lots of questions, get lots of help, and just make sure that you have a few launches under your belt that go well, and then start doing a few of them independently without needing as much help and have them continue to go well. Um, so you can't really zoom usually at a, at a company that has an APM type program, you can't zoom past the APM level, you need to just actually get through that life cycle of um, the product life cycle of shipping things and showing that you can do it independently without errors. How would you recommend a PM handle a situation where engineering is not being invested enough uh, in order to reach roadmap goals? I'm nice. uh, sorry. Yeah. Did you get that? Yeah. I'm assuming this is about uh, technical debt and like technical investments. So um, I see you nodding. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's a few different ways to handle technical debt. Um, one of them is the charcuterie board approach that I that I'd laid out. So say like, hey, look, do we all agree that at least 10% of our roadmap should be towards technical debt? Great. Okay, I'm going to set this this many weeks aside. I'm going to let the head of engineering decide the best investment there. That's one approach. Um, another approach is to tie technical investment work to the product features and have that be part of your cost estimate of the new product. You say, in order to build this and make it scalable, we're gonna to need to first start by building this part and then build this. And then depending on your team, you have a few ways you can slice up how you do technical debt. It can either go, um, like I was saying, like the, the first 10 weeks or the last 10 weeks of the quarter are gonna to be towards technical debt, or we're gonna have uh, one person out of three work on technical debt. So there's a few, each of them has trade offs. Uh, what advice would you give someone who is coming from a non-traditional tech background to break into product management? Um, non-traditional tech background uh, to break in. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit different. I'm ways. assuming that it means, uh, I, actually, I don't know if that means tech a tech background that's non-traditional or it's not a tech background, so it's non-traditional that it's not from tech. I'll let you take it either way you want. Sure, 
So um, a few different ways to break into product management. Um, the best way uh, after you're out of school is to, is to do an internal transfer. So to take the credibility that you've earned at your company, people, you know the product really well and um, people know you and they know you can do great work and then start talking to PMs, talk to the PM manager and ask if there's any projects you can start to take on. Um, at many companies, that's the best way to get in. Um, another option is to join a large company that does, uh, that does product well and, or sorry, if you're at a large product company that does product well, um, but like a company like Google doesn't take very many internal transfers to PM. So instead what you do is absorb as much as you can about the PM processes just as an observer. And then you can move to a smaller company, use your specialized skills, whatever it is that you, you have been doing all of this time until you wanted to do the transfer and combine that with your knowledge of, of how a great company does product. And then you can get um, often a PM job at a smaller company. Um, and in any of these cases, I'd say the best way to break in is informational chats. So reach out however you can. This could be Twitter. This could be through your school network. This could be any, any connection you can find to see if somebody will just uh, take a few minutes and talk to you about the company. Uh, when they're in these informational interviews, they're in pitch mode, they want to tell you about the company. And now you can ask them, like, what do you look for in a PM? What's your current strategy? Um, you know, what is, and you can ask them, like, for yourself, like, is there anything that I should be working on to, you know, make myself a better candidate for PM? And a lot of times when people are pitching you on the role, uh, afterwards, as long as you are close to uh, what they're looking for, they often will submit your resume um, and try to help you get that job. This question is from Redmond. What is your recommended prioritization framework? Okay, so this is another one of these. So the, the two questions I got about what framework do you use, I think are showing, I'm gonna kind of turn these around. because I think uh, this is showing a, a kind of pitfall that I sometimes see, um, especially MBA students fall into, which is this idea that there's a right framework that's gonna give you the right answer and you'll get an A plus on it. Um, and that's not how product works. Um, with product, we are, um, we are, uh, inventing new solutions to problems that haven't been solved before. So there isn't going to be a right answer. And the kinds of problems that come to PMs almost always require judgment. Um, so there are almost all of these problems that you see as a PM are going to have one of these like it depends kind of answer. And it's your job to figure out what does it depend on? You know, does it, uh, does it depend on, you know, like, who the, uh, like what the company goals are, or does it depend on what stage of product that you're at, or does it depend on um, and any of these other things? So I do think that for prioritization, like to answer this particular question, I think the real answer is like, make sure you come up with your strategy first and then tie your prioritization to what will help you achieve that strategy. Um, but that strategy is then going to have to depend on a lot of things. So for example, um, a lot of times people are in a situation where they have current customers in, a, in one market that they serve really well, and they have a new market they want to go after. And you'll need to make this, this tough judgment call along with the rest of your team to figure out how, uh, how much of our energy should we spend supporting the current customers and how much should we spend going towards the new ones. And the answer might be 80-20, 50-50, it might be 0-100, um, but really uh, understanding the, the larger strategic implications and what bets you want to make as a company. Uh, now I want to get to a question from uh, Ones about, here it is, what to do if right before launch of a product, the engineering team has resource constraints and is not able to complete key features? Um, there's a lot more context to it, but I think that's enough to really give you something to, to respond to. So, Thanks, yeah, and I, I see the, the question over there in the chat, and I think that this, this uh, instinct to think about communication is exactly the right one. I think you want to... Um, tell people as soon as possible. And I think that um, you mentioned about like, how do you communicate with your direct manager? With your direct manager, this is uh, this framework I've mentioned before of like, here's the situation that happened. Here's how I'm thinking of handling it. What do you think? Works really well here. So you say like, hey, I just found out that the engineer, we're gonna miss our launch date. Um, what I'm thinking of doing is quickly sending a message to all of the stakeholders to send them an email. Uh, what do you think? And they might be like, great, go ahead, do that. Or they might be like, whoa, whoa, before you send an email for, you know, did you first check this data and check this data and check this data? So, um, so that framework gives them a chance to agree, to appreciate the work you've done, take that ownership, and then, and then give you advice for what can come next. 
Um, but yeah, definitely when you notice something uh, like that, I think your instinct of talking to your manager is exactly right and, and do it as, as quickly as possible. And I want to give a, a shout out to my former student, Jeremy Santos, who wrote, who wrote to you, Jackie, just want to say that reading Cracking the PM interview was the best prep I did to find my first PM role. I've been recommending it to others, asking for advice on the switch to PM. So had to share with the group uh, a statement from my former student and, and some and kudos to you, Jackie. Uh, this is uh, from Saurabh. Any suggestions for management, a management consultant transitioning to a PM role? Um, and I'm going to kind of add to that with two ways to, um, I'm going to break that down into two parts I'd like to add to that. As you're if you're wanting to transition from a management consultant role to a PM role, what should you do like to prove yourself? And uh, then what, uh, how would you communicate that to get the job? Nice. So, um, so management consultant moving to PM, I would think about like, what are the strengths and weaknesses? So the strengths is management consultants, you know, generally have very strong analytical skills, generally have st very strong strategic skills. And what I might be looking for is ownership. Um, and I might be looking for product design. Those are probably my two guesses of what someone in management consulting might be missing. Um, and so, um, Definitely, I think that if you do have a chance to do a side project where you actually own th something through from beginning to end um, and do a little bit of your own design work, that would be ideal. Um, but if you can't do that, I would say that in the current projects that you're doing and that you're thinking about, anything more you can do to sort of show this results-oriented um, follow through on what you've been working on of like, not just that like I like did this project and the end result was my recommendation, but, um, but being able to follow up and saying, and they took the recommendation and it worked, um, that, that kind of follow through and ownership mentality of treating yourself, uh, of showing that you, um, that you can take that full ownership would be, would be one of the areas to focus on. I wanna remind you that uh, we have now at the Foster School of Business, the Product Management Center. This is a resource for students from every school at the University of Washington. And it's a resource for every alumni at the University of Washington. And it's a resource for the entire community of current and aspiring product managers. The Product Management Center is a home for knowledge. It's a hub for community and for impact. So you could shape the life of one of our very talented students, or you can uh, learn from some of the best innovative companies here in our backyard of Seattle, um, or you learn, uh, come to an event and learn and, and grow on your own. So the Foster the Product events are open to the public. The next one's March 4th. You could find that on the Product Management Center website that I shared there. The LinkedIn group is also open to everybody and it's intended to be a, a free flow and an exchange of ideas and jobs and anything that we wanna help make our PM community stronger. And if you want to reach out to me, if you have any ideas of how the Product Management Center could collaborate with the group that you're involved with uh, or really help to uh, achieve our mission, which is to foster community, to generate and disseminate knowledge, and to promote and encourage diversity in the PM community. So thank you so much for being here. I hope to see you March 4th. I hope to see you at the Inclusive Product Management Summit on May 7th. Um, if your employer won't uh, cover the registration fee, we have scholarships available. So please don't let cost be a barrier to coming to the Inclusive Product Management uh, Summit on May 7th, where you can learn about the future of product, uh, product management and learn to build more inclusive products and manage more inclusive teams.